St. Louis was the site of the first public school kindergarten system in the U.S. It was started in 1873. By that point, St. Louis was the fourth largest city in the U.S. Lots of folks from other places were moving to St. Louis, this gateway of the West, including African Americans fleeing the Civil War, and immigrants of all types, though Germans were especially prominent. They were filling this booming city to work in the manufacturing and transportation jobs in this prominent Mississippi port. People there divided along all kinds of lines, everyone you can think of, religion, race, ethnicity, and class. And public schooling was one solution to create common ground that could link all these different sorts of people. The system was created in 1838, but by 1870, William T. Harris, the superintendent, who would go on to serve as one of the leading figures in late 19th century education reform, was looking for a way to keep young kids, especially, in the schools. These were kids that he dealt with the most who were coming from the levee and the industrial manufacturing districts. And he worked with Susan Blow, who was the daughter of an industrialist, to study the idea of kindergarten. He was hoping that kindergarten would help keep these kids in school. These levee kids were, quote, surrounded by the haunts of vice and inequity. And Harris proclaimed that the lucky ones were those who started work early. At least they learned the habits of industry if they didn't learn much else. The unfortunate ones grew up in crime, he proclaimed. For these young kids, the family was failing, and Harris sought to get rid of the minimum age of six so that he could get these three and four and five-year-olds into the school system earlier. Help me, kindergarten education. You're my only hope. Now, Susan Blow, again, who was the daughter of a wealthy industrialist, did some globetrotting in her youth and came to the conviction that early childhood education was her calling. She studied kindergartens elsewhere and brought what she learned to her hometown to institute this kindergarten in 1873. In the kindergartens of St. Louis, as administered by Blow, youngsters did a lot of work with three-dimensional objects, as was the style of Pestalozzi and Froebel. They worked with cubes and spheres and cylinders, and they learned to draw and measure skills that might help them in their future industrial work in the factory or in the house. Still, the major focus was on moral discipline. Games were the primary pedagogical tool in this kindergarten, but not games like baseball or Parcheesi. Instead, these were games like standing around in a circle, singing about how great it is to work together with other people or go to church. As the theorists had it, circle games were a metaphor for citizenship. Uh, as one reformer said it, anybody can spoil it, yet no one can play it alone. Now, the kindergartens in St. Louis grew quickly, from 68 pupils taught in an experimental class by Susan Blow in the first year to 7,828 students with over 200 teachers by 1880, only seven years later. Some of these teachers were volunteers, but most weren't. They were almost exclusively women, and the work served as a kind of finishing school for these young ladies from better families between the end of school and marriage. Now, there were critics of this kindergarten as it emerged in St. Louis. Some of them said it was too German. They were very critical of German pedagogy and these German ideas, and all these German immigrants taking over their city. Now, a more persuasive criticism, at least from the point of view of the school board, was that kindergarten was expensive. Harris calculated at one point that it cost $16 per pupil to educate children in kindergarten compared to $12 per pupil for a regular school. The school board for a year instituted a fee of a dollar a quarter for those who could afford it, but it actually found that kindergarten was so popular that it flip-flopped the next year and dropped the fee. In 1881, the kindergarten was even expanded to include African-American children, albeit in segregated schools. And although the kindergarten in St. Louis started off to protect neglected poor children from the slums, Harris expanded the argument for kindergarten to include the children of the rich. He proposed that wealthy children suffered mediocre instruction at the hands of servants while their wealthy parents were outperforming their public and social duties. As Harris wrote, a child of poverty is saved by the good associations and the industrial and intellectual training he gets. If he is a child of wealth, he is saved by the kindergarten from ruin through the self-indulgence and corruption ensuing on weak management in the family. Those poor little rich boys and girls Kindergarten could save them, too. Now, if things were going so swimmingly, why didn't this version of mass kindergarten, involving not just five-year-olds, but three-year-olds and four-year-olds, why didn't it take off? Now, the critics 
who had complained about it being too German, about it being too expensive, they weren't the ones who won out. The real sticking point when it came to St. Louis was a legal challenge that was brought. The city charter only provided for education of ages 6 to 20. This persuaded the state Supreme Court to rule against the kindergarten program in 1883, just 10 years after it got started. The city in the end worked out a compromise to keep a voluntary program for five-year-olds, but they were forced to charge a fee. As historian Selwyn Troen notes, these pioneering efforts to meet the problems of the post-Civil War industrial city were checked by a legal document drawn for a smaller and less complicated society. Even though the St. Louis kindergarten program was curtailed, those who were in charge of it went on to do many great things to help propagate the idea. Susan Blow, who had already attracted a raft of disciples who propagated her methods elsewhere, left St. Louis to teach at Columbia's teacher college. Harris moved on to become the U.S. Commissioner of Education, where he continued to enthusiastically support the idea of kindergarten. Even from Washington, he would plead for the state of Missouri to lower the school age to four, but to no avail. Kindergarten would settle into a schooling option for five-year-olds, a step on the way to first grade, one offered in increasing numbers of cities, but something that would remain rare in rural parts of America. Why would it take so long to institutionalize the kindergarten? We'll consider that in the next module.